the hello uh, viewers uh, the data transfer techniques that you have discussed so far belong to the category of parallel mode of data transfer we have seen that data transfer take place through eight parallel lines in terms of bytes but this cannot be done in many situations and that's a, that has led to the use of serial mode of data transfer so first let us see why serial mode of data transfer first of all whenever the equipment the io device is not housed in the same box it is little away from the uh, cpu or computer then the cabling cost you have to use a cable to connect the io device to the microcomputer and the cost of cable will be more if you use parallel lines on the other hand if you use serial line where where, where you require only a pair of wire and a common ground line so by only three wires has to go from the microcomputer so here it will be microcomputer not really microprocessor and from the microcomputer to io you will require a pair of line and a common ground line so the cost of cabling will be reduced if you use serial mode of data transfer second reason for that is uh, whenever you bunch a number of cables together the current flowing in one pair of cable have induces some signal in other wires and commonly this is prevalent in telephone network and which we call cross talk so to reduce cross talk uh, the serial mode of data transfer is preferable because you are using only a pair of wire so it minimizes the effect of noise third reason is you will find that there exist a number of communication media rather the availability of suitable communication media you have a number of serial communication media commonly used in our day to day life for example telephone line microwave link satellite link and so on all are serial in nature where data transfer take place bit by bit rather than byte by byte so we have to to make use of the, this uh, communication media we have to go for serial mode of data transfer then Uh, there are many devices which are inherently serial in nature for example uh, tapes you have to read bit by bit you cannot read uh, uh, all the lamp, i mean by in terms of bytes so inherent device character characteristic may be serial in nature finally nowadays you have got uh, many portable equipment like uh, digital camera pdas cell phones sometimes you have to connect them to computer and if these devices use 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 parallel port then the connector has, will be big and uh, as a result it will not be feasible so to have small connector it is necessary to go for serial mode of data transfer so these are the various reasons uh, uh, for the use of serial mode wide spread use of serial mode of data transfer let us see what are the different types of serial data transfer that take place the simplest one is you have got a microcomputer and it is communicated to in one, uh, the io device only in one direction so this is a io device so microcomputer to io device data transfer take place only in one direction so this is known as simplex method simplex where the io device is only receiving data from the microcomputer for example it can be a printer on the other hand the io the io device can be little intelligent and communication can take place in both directions say this is a microcomputer and here is your io device and uh, the data transfer can take place in this direction as well as in the other direction so in such a case the io device device is communicating in both direction with the microcomputer and this particular technique is known as full duplex 
where simultaneously data transfer in both directions is possible obviously in serial in nature, serial form bit by bit. So this is known as full duplex. But there are some situations where there exist only one communication media between the IO and the microcomputer. And through the same media data transfer takes place in this direction as well as in the other direction. And th that means you are making use of the same media for data transfer in both directions. You may have seen the traffic police communicating with their, uh, uh, send, uh, with their head office. So whenever the traffic police is, is uh, talking, the other side is listening. And then he says over, then he says over, then the and he listens what is being told by the from the head office. So there, uh, the a common media or common frequency, carrier frequency is used for data transfer in both directions. So here also, uh, you have to make use of suitable protocol for data transfer in both directions because at a time it can go either from the microcomputer to the I/O or from I/O to the microcomputer. And this particular technique is known as half duplex. So half duplex, full duplex and simplex, these are the three possible types of uh, serial uh, data transfer take place in, uh, in, com in day to day use. And let us see what are the possible modes by which data transfer is possible, serial mode of data transfer is possible. One is known as, there are two techniques, one is known as asynchronous. In asynchronous mode, what is done, uh, the data that is being sent, usually data is sent in terms of characters or bytes. Characters can be ASCII characters or you are sending byte by byte. Either that means either you are sending character by character or byte by byte. And in asynchronous mode, each character is framed before sending data. And the framing is done in this form. Say, let me show you the format, format that is being used for asynchronous mode. First of all, it sends a start bit. This is the start. After that, a number of bytes, a number of bits, say this is your, can be D0, D0, then D1. In this way, uh, 5 to 7, 5 to 8 bits can be sent one after the other. And these bits can be uh, 0 or 1. That's why I'm showing it this way. And after the 5 to 8 bits are sent, there is a optional parity bit. So there is a, this is a parity bit. And it is followed by stop bits. And stop bits can be either of 1 bit or it can be of one and a half bit or two bits. This is the common format of a asynchronous uh, mode of data transfer. That means you are sending a character which can be of five to eight bits in length. So this is your data that you are sending. And uh, this, you are framing it with the, with, by using a start bit in the beginning. That means you are sending in this way. This is the time. You are sending first the start bit, then the lower order bit, then the next bit, then the next bit, D2 bit, and so on. In this way, it can be up to, say, D7, 8 bit, but it can be uh, D4 as well, whenever you are sending 5 bits. Then it can, it can follow, it, can be fo it is followed by a parity bit. A parity bit can be sent, but this is optional. It may be present, it may not be present. Then you'll be sending stop bits of 1 or 1 and half or 2 bits in length. You may be asking why this kind of framing is done. This framing is done for self-synchronization. Self-synchronization. 
for, for self synchronization of each of these bits, each of these characters. How it is happening? So, initially, the, whenever the data is not being sent, the, it remains in that, it, it remains in that uh, mark that is called the mark, mark position or we can say high state, it remains in that state. And as the line goes down, the receiver knows that some data is coming, some data is being sent. So, and the rate at which it is being sent, that means the duration of each of the bit is also known by the receiver, that is predetermined. We shall see how it can be done. So, uh, after a start bit comes, the receiver is ready to receive the data and then it will keep on sending in the middle of each of these bits to get the data. So, in this way it will receive 7 bit and for error detection purpose this parity bit is being used and then again uh, it will receive the stop bits and after the stop bits is over then the full character is received. So, after that data may not be sent for some duration and whenever another data is sent again it begin, begins with start bit. So, each character is synchronized with the help of a start bit. That is why I am calling it, it is self synchronizing. Moreover, uh, in whenever you use this asynchronous mode, there is some tolerance in clock frequency. You see, this is the set transmitter is not sending the clock to the receiving side. And as a result, there may be some difference in clock frequency at the transmitter at the receiving end. Whenever you are using asynchronous mode, even when there is small difference in frequency, the data transfer will be possible. That means you are uh, starting after the synchronization is done by the start bit, you are looking at the middle of each bit. Now, whenever you reach the last bit, even if you are within this range, one bit range, then you will receive correctly. That means, if this instead of sensing here, if you sense it somewhere here or here, you will receive correct data. So, there is some tolerance. So, this tolerance can be suppose you are sending 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so I mean 8 plus 1, 9, 10 and say 11 bits you are sending. So, in 11 bits half bit tolerance is there plus minus half bit that means about uh, 1 by 20 that means plus minus 5 percent difference in clock frequency uh, can, can be there even then there will be correct data transfer. So, the, the, there is no need to uh, send the clock to the receiving side and uh, with, even with 5 percent difference in clock frequency, the data transfer is possible. However, uh, it has got some overhead. What is the overhead? You see, you are sending only one byte of data, but you are sending 11 bits. So, to send 8 bit data, you are sending 11 bits. 11, 8 plus 1, 9, 10, yeah, 11, at least 11 bits will be required. So, you see there is an overhead of 11 minus 8 by 8, 3 by 8 into say 100 percent. So, this is the extra bits or extra overhead that you are incurring and this is quite significant as you can see. So, uh, although this is simple, to implement, it has some limitations and some advantages as well. So, the main advantage is self synchronization, second advantage is the tolerance in clock frequency. However, you are, pay, you are uh, paying for that, the, uh, the, the, pay, the, 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 pay, the, pay, the payment that you are making for this is the uh, high overhead for asynchronous mode. So, you are, uh, if you do not want uh, this inefficiency, do not accept this inefficiency, then you have to go for synchronous mode.
in synchronous mode no such framing of data is done that means the kind of framing that you did here this kind of framing is not done what you are doing you will send a character initially you will send some string character synchronization character maybe one or sometimes two synchronization characters are also sent another string character and after that you will keep on sending data data characters this is your data data without any extra bits and then you will at the end you may send some checksum for error detection if necessary or it may not be there so you see suppose you are sending uh, uh, 10 kilobyte 10 kilobyte of data then the extra overhead is only two sync characters two synchronization characters and maybe at the end one checksum character so 3 by 10 k into 100 this is the percentage so you see this is very insignificant about 0 0.03 plus percent so in this case overhead is very small however it has some problem the problem is although the overhead is very small in this case it is very efficient because uh, the overhead is small the problem is that the clock the clock frequency should be identical should be same at the transmitting end transmit both in the transmitter and receiver because you are starting a uh, you are starting a large number of characters you may synchronize somewhere here with the help of synchronization characters but afterwards if there is small difference in clock frequency you may not receive the uh, characters which are sent later on uh, in correct form so that's why either the clock has to be sent from the transmitter to the receiver or the clock has to be regenerated so that's why this is not uh, widely used this asynchronous asynchronous mode is more popular how do you implement it so in this context let me explain another con concept that is called baud rate what is baud rate we have seen that the for sending data in asynchronous modes you are sending 11 bits but you are essentially sending 8 bit data and baud rate specifies number of signal elements you are sending per unit time suppose you are sending uh, one byte or say uh, 110 uh, bits per second then your baud rate is baud rate is 110 bits per second but what is the data rate you have seen you are sending 11 bits for one byte so you are essentially sending uh, instead of 10 bytes you have sent 8 bytes so uh, the total number of characters that you have sent is 80 80 bits so 110 bits have been sent to send 80 bits of data so you can say the data rate is 80 bits per second but baud rate is 110 bits per second that is due to extra overhead so we see that the baud rate and bit data rate the unit is same here also it is bits per second baud rate is also bit per second but here it represents how many signal elements you are sending per unit time whereas here you are telling how many bits per how many bits of data you are sending per unit time so that's the difference between baud rate and data rate so you'll be hearing about baud rate frequently in the context of data communication now let us see how we can implement the 
serial mode of data transfer. We can implement it by with the help of SID and SOD line that we have already discussed available in 8085 microprocessor. We have seen that 8085 microprocessor was provided with some additional lines SID and SOD. We can make use of these two lines to transfer data in serial form. So what you have to do? This is your 8085 microprocessor. the microcomputer and this is your some IO device. You can link them with the help of SID and SOD line. So this is your SOD going from the microcomputer 8085 microprocessor and this is coming from the IO device and going to the SID line, SID and SOD. So and then of course you have to use some common ground line that has to be there. So by using a, these two lines without any additional hardware, you can perform serial mode of data transfer. Obviously you have to use, you have to make use of these instructions, SIEM and RIM, which I have already explained. SIEM is a dual purpose instruction. This part is used for interrupt masking, let us ignore this part. Suppose you want to send one on the SOD line. So this bit has to be one to enable the SOD bit and this bit has to be one. So one, one that means C0. That means if you write say MVI C0, MVI A C0, then execute SIM, it will transfer one on the SOD line, one is transferred. On the other hand, if you write say MVI A40, that means this bit is 0 and this bit is 1. You are enabling this bit. So if you are writing 0, 1, 0, 0, so that makes it 4, 4, 0 in hex. And then execute SIM. That means from the accumulator it will go to the SOD line. So that is how you can transfer, you can transfer 0, 0 is sent. So here you can send 1, you can send 0. Similarly you can receive through the SID line by executing RIM instruction. If you execute RIM instruction, the most significant bit uh, of the accumulator will contain the value of SID. That means if you execute say RIM, after executing RIM, the most significant bit of the accumulator will have the uh, value of the SID value, I mean whether it is 0 or 1. So that you can check by looking at the, uh, if you remember there is a flag bit, sign bit. So by looking at the sign bit, you can check the content, the value of that SID, that the serial data that we have received. So you see, Without any extra hardware, you can implement serial mode of data transfer by using 8085. And this is how it can be done. However, the most popular use of serial mode of data transfer comes elsewhere. Let us see where it is used. Uh, nowadays, everybody is having internet connection and the inter internet connection is available through telephone line and the telephone line is serial in nature, a pair of line, a twisted pair. So this is your uh, serial in nature. So in such a case, what you normally do, you make use of modem. You make use of a modem because this telephone line is not only serial in nature, it is analog in nature. So modem performs the modulation and demodulation which converts uh, the digital data into analog form and analog to digital form that means modulation demodulation. So here also you will use another modem and this side will be connected between the microcomputer. So here you have got one microcomputer, another computer is here and these two are linked with the help of two modems and the communication is done through telephone line. 
a new stand standard was developed to interface the computer with the modem and for that purpose the standard is known as RS 232C. So, RS 232 serial interface that standard was developed so that uh, you can use modem of any make and the computer interface this through this standard interface any modem can be interfaced. So, this is this particular interface is known as RS 232C and actually two separate terminologies is used this equipment this computer or it can be some other type of device this is known as DT data terminal equipment and modem is commonly known as DC data communication equipment and this is all another DC another DT. So, what you are doing two data terminal equipments are communicating through a serial link it can be a telephone line, it can be lease line, it can be satellite link, satellite link or it can be anything. So, through the modem the communication is being done and the interface between the modem and microcomputer is RS232C. So, DT and DC interface is known as RS232C and RS232C is a serial link, the type of link that I have just discussed and it is widely used. So, let us briefly discuss about this standard interface and we shall see how this standard interface can be used to interface modem. Not only it can be used to interface modem, nowadays various input output devices like printer, plotter and various other devices are also interfaced through this uh, RS-232C. Let us see uh, the details of RS-232C. Any standard has four important components mechanical, electrical, functional and procedural. Let us see in case of RS 232 C what is mechanical. By mechanical we mean the type of connector that will be used for interfacing. In case of RS 232 C a 25 pin connector is used looking like which looks like the, this as for interfacing between the DT and DC. And uh, of course, there is a male and female connector with the help of which the mechanical interfacing is done between the DT and DC. And of course, the various pin, pin lines are there that those functions will be discussed later on. So, the first component is mechanical. Mechanical specifies the type of connector, mechanical component that you require. Second important component is electrical. Electrical component specifies what voltage, what current, what is the length of cable, what is the rate at which data transfer can be done. These electrical parameters are specified with the help of this electrical component or electrical part of the specification. So, in case of RS 232 C as you can see here a 0 is represented by plus 3 volt to plus 20 volt, 25 volt. Usually of course, it is plus 12 volt and similarly, a 1 is represented by minus 3 to uh, minus 25. Any voltage in this range is considered as 1. In practice, it is minus 20, minus 12 volt. So, plus 12 volt is used for to represent 0 and minus 12 volt is represent to represent 1. Of course, the standard says plus 3 to minus plus plus 3 to plus 25 for 0 and minus 3 to minus 25 for 1. But in practice, plus 12 is used to represent 0 and plus minus 12 is used to represent 1. So, it is not TTL compatible. You must note this point. So, you have to use some extra device to make it TTL compatible and the maximum cable length that can be used is 50 feet, maximum baud rate you, you see here I am specifying my baud rate not data rate or bit rate. Baud rate is 20 kilobits per second. So, for RS232 this is the electrical specification and the functional power component of the specification specifies what are the function of different lines which is given here. Although the correct connector that is being used is 25 pin in practice 9 pins are commonly used 
and the function of each of these pins are shown here. Pin number 1 is protective ground, pin number 2 is transmit data to DC, data communication equipment that means it is going from DT to DC. Then receive data from DC which is the short name is RxD, request to send to DC RTS, so it is going to DC from DT, clear to send from DC, so it is com coming from uh, data communication equipment to data terminal equipment, data set ready from DC, so from DC to DT it is coming, then signal ground pin number 7, pin number 9 is data carrier detect from DC. DCD short name and data terminal ready to DC, it is going to DC and it is short name is DTR. So these are the commonly used function, function I mean pins and their functionalities are shown here. So the functional specification specifies the function of each of these line. Then there is a procedural part, by procedural means the sequence of events that will take place for data transfer. Procedural means the protocol that you have to follow and as you, as you will see here, I have connected a DTE with a DC, the interconnection is shown here, of course the ground is there, signal ground and common ground which I have not shown are also there. Then you can see here TXD is connected to RXD, that means pin number 2 of DTE is going to is TXD, TXD is going to RXD, here also it is pin number 2, then TXD is connected to RXD of DT and RTS is going to RTS of DC, CTS from DC is coming to CTS of DT and DSR is coming from DC to uh, DT and DTR is going from DT to D, D, uh, DT to DC. So what is the procedural uh, operation here? First of all, with the help of these two pairs of lines, the DC and DT checks whether both sides are on or not, ready for data transfer or not. That means this DTR conveys to the DC that it is, it is ready for communication. So before anything is done, the uh, modem checks whether the computer is on or not and computer also checks whether the modem is not which is conveyed by the DSR. So these two lines are, these two pairs of lines are used for to checking the uh, operation or the uh, whether the DT and DC are operational or on or not. Then these RTS and CTS are used for handshaking for data transfer between the two. That means the DTE will send a request to send to the DC and only when clear to signal comes then it will send data, one character of data to the DC. Then again it will send a request to send to the DC and only after uh, CTS comes, clear to send comes from the DC it will send another character of data. So this is how these two pair lines are used for handshaking of data transfer between DT and DC. So this is the procedural part of the function. So this is how the data communication is done in RS-232C. And obviously implementing this interface is not very easy without some support. And so another programmable IO chip has been used for that purpose. So that programmable IO chip is known as the 8251 USA-RT. USART stands for Universal Synchronous Asynchronous Receive Transmit Device, Universal Synchronous Asynchronous Receive Transmit. So this is another special purpose programmable IO device and how uh, this 8251 is interfaced to the microprocessor is shown with the help of this diagram. So this side goes to the microprocessor side, the system bus, as you can see here, uh, data lines, read, write, clock, this is command or data which is connected to A0 address line and then A1 to A17 are used to 
map the resistors, various resistors on the address bus of the uh, IO address bus. And so chip select will be uh, generated uh, based on the decoder circuit and on which these addresses are mapped. And the various resistors available are shown here. And this side goes to the modem. And this part TXD, TXC, TX ready, this part is used for transmit control. For transmit control, then as we have already discussed, DSR, DTR, RTS, and CTS, these are used for modem control to control the modem. And these three are used for receive control. Now, for any programmable I/O device, it is essential to understand the operation of the various registers and how they are being used, are accessed, and how what are the different bit configurations, which are explained uh, here. This 8 to 5 1 has got a number of registers. So you see here, for transmit purpose, there are two registers. One is transmit buffer, another is transmit SIP. So the microprocessor, whenever it writes into this transmit uh, into this register, it goes to the transmit buffer. Then it is shifted to this register and it shifted out on this TXD line. Similarly, whenever the data comes through this receive line, RXD line, it goes to the receive shift and it gets shifted into the uh, into this receive shift register. And only when eight bits of data are accumulated, it goes to the receive buffer and then the uh, microprocessor can read it through these data lines to the accumulator. And this concept of using two register one for both, I mean, uh, for transmit as well as receive is known as double buffering. And here, the advantage is that whenever the transmission is going on, you can write another byte of data here. Similarly, when the receiving is going on, this data which has been already trans which has been already received can be read by the microprocessor. So both the operation can be performed in parallel because of this double buffering available here. However, uh, you have the microprocessor can access either this transmit buffer or the receive buffer as you can see here. And to do that, this bit has to be uh, this this uh, CD bit that command of data. That means this bit is zero. That means it is data. Data means zero zero. It is receive or uh, transmit. Receive buffer or transmit buffer, depending on whether you are reading or writing. When you are reading, it is come. It comes from the receive buffer. When you are write, you are writing, then it goes to the transmit buffer. That is decided with the help of these two bits. Then there is a status register which can be accessed uh, by using comment. This is this is a comment. Uh, this bit has to be one. This is a comment register, and by using what zero one, you can read this status register. However, as you can see here, mode register, synchronization character one, synchronization character two, and control register. All these registers are provided with a single address. So how do you access four registers by using a single address? That can be done by accessing them in a sequence which is explained with the help of this flowchart. This flowchart explains how these four registers can be accessed one after the other by using the same address, single address. So whenever the, the uh, device is resetted with the help of this signal, reset signal coming from the microprocessor, it goes to this point. Then, then whenever it generates this value, CD1, and it is writing, it goes to the mode register. Mode register can be either for asynchronous mode or it can be for synchronous mode. There are two separate register for synchronous mode and asynchronous mode. And if it is asynchronous, it, if it is asynchronous mode, then it goes in this way. And depending on the value of, of the A0 bit, 
it will read the control control word so mode word and control word are to be accessed when asynchronous mode is used only on the other hand whenever synchronous mode is used you have to access uh, you have to write into mode register synchronization character 1 or if you are using two synchronization character two synchronization two sync characters so this you have to access mode register synchronization character 1 and synchronization character 2 if you are using synchronous mode of data transfer so this is how the different registers can be accessed by using the same address and uh, in a sequence you have to do that means after we said if you follow this sequence as you can see you can read mode register control register you can read synchronization character 1 synchronization character 2 and all these four registers mode synchronization character 1 synchronization character 2 control registers are although having the same address they can be accessed one after the other in a sequence and that sequence I have already explained. Now let us look at the format of the mode word which is very important uh, to understand due to program the functionality of the device. So it has got 8 bits, bit 0 and bit 1 specifies whether it is synchronization mode if it is for synchronous mode or not if these two bits are 0 0 then it goes to synchronous mode that means whether it is synchronous or asynchronous this decision is done based on the bit values you write here 0 0 or not on the other hand other bits decides the clock frequency 1x 16x or 64x you see here it will be it will be connecting a single clock frequency for transmit as well as for receive you can see here this is the receive clock here is the transmit clock however by programming obviously whenever a single clock frequency is connected you can have only single baud rate but this allows you to, to have uh, three different baud rates whenever it is 1 0 these two bits are 1 0 this bit is 1 this bit is 0 then the baud rate is decided by that clock frequency txc or rxc on the other hand if it is 0 1 that means this is 1 and this is 0 then the baud rate is 1 16th that clock frequency is divided by 16 and the baud rate is baud rate is 16x it is called 16x similarly if it is 1 1 then the baud rate is clock frequency by 64 so you can have three different baud rates for a give for a particular clock frequency clock connected to the transmit or receive so these two bits decide that then l1 and l2 these two bits specifies whether your data is of 5 bit 6 bit 7 bit or 8 bit as I have told in asynchronous mode you can send 5 bit to 8 bit how many bits you are sending that is decided by these two bits and uh, as I told there is an uh, parity which is optional so if you want don't want to use make this bit 0 if you want to use parity bit make this bit 1 so parity bit can be enabled or disabled by writing into this bit into this bit position and it can be even parity or odd parity so that is also decided by this bit EP that means uh, even parity bit so one, if it is 1 you are using even parity if this is 0 you are using odd parity then the these two bits S1 and S2 decides whether the start bit the stop bit as we have seen if you remember the I said that stop bit can be 1 1 and half or 2 bits so the stop bit what is the size of the stop bit is decided with the help of these two s1 and s2 it can be of 1 bit it can be of 1 and half bit or it can be of 2 bits so stop bit size is decided by these two, these two bits so you have to initialize the mode word format before you start transmitting data uh, through the uh, 8 to 5 1 and this is for the asynchronous mode and if these two bits are 0 then the mode word corresponds to synchronous mode as you can see here these two bits are 0 here 
and in synchronous mode the mode word format is given here. So these two bits L1 and L2 will decide whether the characters that you are sending one after the other whether it is a 5 bit or 6 bit or 7 bit or 8 bit. Similarly, this bit is parity enable that means each character can have a separate parity bit or may not have this is optional and you have the choice of even parity or odd parity based on this bit. And this is extra synchronization detection. Uh, there is a syndan input. You will see there is a syndate input. This is for extra synchronization whether you will make use of or not that is decided by this. And as I told uh, you can use a single character for synchronization or double character that is decided by this bit. So if it is one then single character and accordingly the uh, you will read uh, one character or two characters as you can see here you can read uh, the synchronization character can be one or two and that is decided by this bit. Now after the mode word is uh, uh, program there is a command word. Actually command word is used to you know that for uh, hand shaking purposes RTS, CTS and various signals are there. For example uh, the command word format is shown here the uh, that uh, this bit least significant bit is used to enable the transmitter the TXEN line is there and which can be enabled TXEN this with the help of this the transmission can be enabled and this is decided by this bit then DTR whenever you make it 0 the data terminal AD bit will become 1 and uh, this RXEN will enable the receive enable bit there is a receive enable bit and you can receive the data whenever you use this uh, I mean enable this then send break character sometimes you are sending some break characters in between and for that purpose it is used and this is used for error reset this is uh, and this is RTS request to send whenever you make it one that request to send line will become uh, active one this is for internal reset and this is for uh, uh, enter hunt mode enter hunt mode means it looks for the synchronization character so this is the common word format of uh, 8251 then uh, you have got that status word Finally, we have seen that there was one register which represents the status word and you can read the status of various lines like TX ready, RX ready, TXC, syndate and DSR. These four, these one, these DSR, syndate, TXC, RX ready and TX ready, these lines essentially reflect the signal on each of these lines. But these three bits require some special explanation. P stands for parity error. So you are, read, you are receiving a character and after receiving a character if there is any parity error whether it, it is odd parity or even parity then in that case this bit will become 1. So this automatically checks the parity as it receives a character the parity is automatically checked and if there is any error then this bit is set. Then this overall error is arising because of you see we ha you have two registers. Suppose uh, you are receiving so quickly that before one byte was read another character has come it has overrun. So that kind of situation is reflected with the help of this bit overrun error bit. That means uh, the synchronization between the reading and receiving, sending and transmitting when they are not proper then overrun error occurs that is also reflected on this bit. Finally framing error, framing error arises because we have seen that that start bit, stop bit and so on and if suppose you instead of the stop bit has to be 1 but instead of 1 you, if you get 0 then it is a framing error. So if you do not receive the data in proper frame, proper uh, order then this framing error bit will be set. So the error situations are reflected in the status word apart from the various signal lines. 
let us see how you can realize a RS 232C interface using the 8251 uh, device, 8251 US, USART chip. Uh, as you know, the 8251 outputs are TTL compatible. So, here you get for 0 uh, level, 0 volt and for 1 level you get plus 5 volt. On the other hand, you know that the RS 232C requires for 0 level it is plus uh, 12 and for 1 it is minus 12. So, you see you have to convert the voltage levels from 0 to uh, plus 12 whenever it is 0 level it has to be converted to plus 12 whenever it is plus 5 it has to be converted to minus 12. So, this converse, for this conversion you have to make use of two devices. For example, you can use 1488 which converts the TTL level to RS 232C level. So, you have to use plus 12 volt minus 12 volt supply here and then this device will convert a TTL level signal which is coming out from the 8251 and it will generate RS-232C level signal. And similarly, you have to use another device 1489 that will convert the uh, RS-232 level signals to TTL level signals. So, here say minus 12 will be converted to 0 volt on this side. So, if it is minus 12 on this side on any one of these lines, you will get 0 volt on any one of this on that line. Similarly, a plus 12 volt will be converted into 0 volt, minus 12 to plus 5 and uh, plus 12 to 0. So, these conversions are done with the help of 1488 and 1489. So, the three output lines coming out from 8 to 5 1 can be used, uh, can use 1488 to get RS 232C level and similarly 1489 is used by the remaining four line DSR, CTS, DCD and RXD which are coming from the uh, RS 232C port and these lines are now connected to that 25 pin connector. This is that 25 pin connector of RS 232C and this side now it can be connected to modem, modem or as we call it the DCE. So, we have seen how you can use the RS 232C. So, here you can use RS 232C to connect to a DC and the DC is connect to the medium or the telephone line and the other side of the telephone line is connected to another modem or DC data communication equipment and then the, uh, the, other, the other side of the DC is connected to DT. That means two data terminal equipment or computers are communicating through uh, the telephone line using two modems. These are the modems. This is, a, this is one modem and they have got another modem here. Now suppose these two DTs or computers are placed side by side, are very close, not far off. There is no need to connect them with the help of telephone line. In that case, these modems are not necessary. So, in, that, in such a situation, can you make use of this RS-232C line? And some technique has been invented for doing that. And that concept is known as null modem. Let us see how null, null modem is implemented. Let us assume there is no uh, modems. So, these modems are not present and obviously uh, you do not require those DCs. In such a case, DCs are, DCs are not there. And two computers, DT and DTE here, two computers com are communicating with each other. So, here you see there is a problem. The pin number 2 TXD is connected to pin number 2 TXD if it is directly connected. How can you overcome that? What can be done? The wiring can be swapped. This line can be connected to RXD which is an input line. Similarly, the, the 
other line, the THD line can of the modem to the other side can be connected in this manner. So in this way, the swapping can be done. So the this wire is going to RXD and this wire is going to uh, this TXD from one uh, computer or DT is going to RXD of the other computer and TXD of this side computer is going to RXD of the other side computer. In a similar manner, the RTS also is swapped. It goes to the CTS and the RTS of the other side of computer is also connected to CTS of this computer. So C RTS is connected to CTS. Similarly, these two lines are tied together and connected to DTR. That means data terminal ready of one computer is connected to DSR and D DCD of the other computer. And similarly, the DTR coming out of it can be connected to the DSR and DCD of the other computer. So this is this particular cable. So now right now we do not have a modem. But what we have done, we have replaced the two modems by a cable, single cable with two connectors. And the connections between these two, the, the wiring between these two connectors are done in such a way that both the DTEs are pulled. The DTEs think as if they are connected to a modem. So the, the absence of modem is not uh, detected by these DTs, but they can communicate without the modem. That's why this simple cable connector combination is known as null modem. And it is a very useful device. And you can see here, the RS232C can be used to connect two computers. Not only it can be used to connect a computer and a modem, but two computers can also be connected. So let us now summarize what you have discussed today. Today we have introduced the concept of serial mode of communication. In this lecture we have seen how the serial mode of communication can be implemented with the help of SID and SOD line. And also we have seen how the serial mode of communication can be uh, implemented very efficiently with the help of a programmable uh, peripheral device known as USA RT, Universal Serial Synchronous Asynchronous Receive Transmit Device. And as you can see, this 8 to 5 1 relieves the burden of the microprocessor. How? Whenever the microprocessor has to send the data, it simply loads it into this transmit buffer, and 8 to 5 1 automatically uh, generates the start bit, then sends the data bits, generates the parity bit if necessary, and also generates the uh, stop bit. So the framing is automatically done by the 851. Similarly, when, whenever a data is received through the serial lines, as it comes in, the uh, start bit, the parity bit, and stop bits are stripped off, and then it is sent to the receive buffer. From where it can be uh, read by the microprocessor. This is how the communication can be done uh, uh, without much load on the microprocessor and 8 to 5 1 will take care of the framing, serial mode of transmission and so on. So friends, we have seen how this programmable peripheral device can help you in implementing the serial mode of data transfer and implementing the RS232C port which is very useful not only for, in, for interfacing the microprocessor to a modem but for interfacing the microprocessor with different types of peripherals like printer, plotter, and so on. And not only that, you can also use it by you use it to connect two computers with the help of non-modem. Essentially, that is nothing but a cable. Thank you.